All right, so today I just want to talk real quickly about a thermostat and how to set it up for a heat pump with an electric furnace backup. And this may be useful for you if you're a homeowner and like to play with these things, but if you don't want to mess with this, um, let us do it. If you're a technician and you would like to kind of brush up on some of these ideas, it's obviously useful. If you've been around for a little bit in the trade, you probably already know all of this and you know more than I'm going to talk about. Um, but if you're newer and you'd like to kind of get familiar with how to set up thermostats for heat pumps, uh, let me go through this real quick. So um, I might sprinkle in some pet peeves here. So the biggest thing is most of your thermostats will come with a user manual that's very useful for the homeowner. And there's going to be an installation manual. And so you have to really observe all of that. Um, and I won't go into all of the details how to mount it and make it airtight but the biggest thing is the wiring so in this case what we have on this job here and we stepped outside so that we can record this um, uh, we have the y terminal we have which is for compressor we have the g terminal which is the fan we have the common which is equivalent to ground we have r which is 24 volts we have the w actually um that one is mounted on the w2 for auxiliary and then we have the OB for the reversing valve, which on most brands, in this case, Linux, is energized in the cooling mode. So hopefully that's useful, but basically you have to use the proper page that talks about your installation. So the biggest thing I can tell you, follow this instruction manual, and if you do so and you understand what it's asking you to do, this will be useful for you. Um, but I'm hoping to point some things out that are often missed, um, and so... Obviously, you won't go over the date and time, but this is the part, the, installa the installer setup that I really want to talk about. And so what I'm going to do here is, obviously, I'm going to hold these two buttons down here to enter the installer setup, and I will use the plus and minus to advance through the different menus. And so I'm going to go a little bit slow. So, like, if you already know this stuff, I don't want you to, like, waste your time watching this. But if you'd like to make sure that there's nothing that you're missing, that maybe be patient and hopefully there will be an aha moment for you at some point throughout this video. So installer setup menu, I'm going to hit select. Um, wait a minute, I think I hit the wrong thing here. Okay, so I gotta hit this button down here to select it. So the first menu is 120 and if you look on the page, it says scheduling options. Depending on your client and your occupant, most common is um, five days a week which would be monday for friday then saturday a different schedule sunday a different schedule so you should talk to your occupant how do you like your schedule write that down what time do you wake up and what time do you want the heat to come on or the cooling to come on and when do you leave for work and on the weekends do you go anywhere or do you like to just have it the same every day so have these questions to really understand what they need and choose the type of programming that matches their needs and if there's homeowners that say look i, I will set it and never touch it all year long, then maybe you want to do non-programmable. Um, if they say, look, I just like to manually turn it up and down occasionally, but I don't want to program anything in the thermostat, that's also a good option, non-programmable. Um, and then for certain people that have that kind of like different types of schedules throughout the week, even during the work week, maybe the seven day programmable would be ideal so that they can choose what they want to do okay so i will not make any changes here i just want to keep on going obviously in our area we have a lot of um, homeowners that are from canada so they use celsius there and some of them prefer that option so remember to offer that if that's the case um, so i'm going to go to let's see how do you go to the next one i thought it was which button do you press i should have read this prior to starting the video um, plus minus to change values or select to advance actually select back 120 okay so select moves me forward should have known this um, number 125 is the temperature scale i will leave it on fahrenheit number 130 is outdoor sensor and these are the two sensor model numbers that are available to order from the supplier and in this case it says there is no outdoor sensor and so now it becomes a wiring problem which we could probably show you a picture of what the wiring looks like but typically there will be wires that go um, on the back of the thermostat the wiring plate and 
usually sensors get wired to these two right here, the S terminals. So there's S1, S2, or just two S terminals, okay? So the way you would wire that is just put those two wires there, wire nut them in the furnace or air handler, and then take that wire all the way out to the sensor, which gets mounted next to the heat pump outside in the shade so that it's not affected by the sunlight, which would cause it to think it's, you know, even today it's like 45 degrees, but it might think it's 70 because of the sunlight. Um, and the outdoor temperature sensor will be used in future menus to decide when the backup heat will come on, in this case, electric heat. The reason for that is heat pump is the primary heat source because, because it's about 25 to 50% more efficient than electric, and electric will kick in to help recover if the heat pump falls behind, or if it's colder than 30 or 35 degrees, and the heat pump just can't produce enough heat, so it's almost useless to even operate that. Okay, so next we will go to, um, so because there is no outdoor sensor, um, some of the menus won't be available. Um, so let me just show you here. It goes to 200 conventional forced air, heat pump, radiant heat. In this case, it's a heat pump, so this has been selected correctly. Let's bump up to 205, heating equipment type. Here it's selected number seven, air-to-air -air heat pump, and that's accurate. Obviously, you have to change this on, dif on every different installation based on what you have. Next, 218, reversing valve is energized in the cool mode, which is the case for most products. Train, American Standard, I think are the opposite. Um, 220, cool stages. If you have a two-stage heat pump, you have to tell this that it's a two-stage heat pump, and you have to have that second wire on Y2. 221, heat stages. These are the backup heat stages, which is your furnace. In this case, we just have one heat stage, but if you have two or three heat stages, again, you have to tell the thermostat that. 255, backup heat source. And here it says number one is electric force air, which is applicable for our situation. If it's propane or natural gas, you would choose number two. 300, system changeover, manual or automatic. Changeover means whether on the menu you can have a heating set point and a cooling set point and the system can, let's just say you have cooling at 72, so if it gets hotter than that, the system will kick into cooling on its own and you have the heating set for 70, so if it, if it gets colder than that in the house, it will heat on its own. I personally like to always have that enabled because it's just useful to for the clients not to have to switch things back and forth. They can still set the thermostat in heat only, or cool only, or in auto, which means heating and cooling set points at the same time. Um, so let's see, 300, uh, next would be 303, auto changeover differential. So, um, since it's not a dead band, yeah, so this is going to do like an internal um, algorithm on how to ch change the dead bend. Usually you can set a dead bend down to two degrees difference. Um, so I don't have any advice on this one. Uh, 340, backup heat. Um, and it says zero. Comfort. That means that the backup heat will initiate probably within a degree. So if the heat pump, so let's just say your house is set for 70 degrees and the heat pump is working but the temperature in the house drops down to 69 while the heat pump is working the thermostat will notice that it's not maintaining so under the comfort setting it's going to kick in the the backup heat to help out the heat pump but if you want to be more conservative on your energy consumption you might change that to two degrees three four degrees so it allows the heat pump to try a bit longer to keep up and only if it gets really bad it'll kick in the backup heat so this will make it less comfortable if you're picky with maintaining a very tight temperature control, but it will make it more um, more efficient and lower your utility bill. So again, this is another conversation you have to have with your client because some clients really care about maintaining a perfect temperature, even if they have to pay a little extra. And some clients, they just, you know, um, don't care so much about perfect temperature, but they care that they save, you know, something on their utility bill. So. Uh, 
have that conversation because it has to meet their need. Let's see, 355, compressor lockout balance point. Okay, the reason this is off is because we don't have an outside uh, temperature sensor. Ideally, you'd like to have an outside temperature sensor and for generic single stage, two stage heat pumps, we like to lock them out at about either 30 or 35 degrees because they're not useful during that time. And again, some homeowners can still extract some heat from, from those heat pumps under those conditions, like in the low 30s, but in most cases, it's just a waste of energy. So we like to lock it out at about 35. So um, in this case, we can't lock it out. So we may have to install an outdoor sensor, wire it in, or if it's a wireless one, it's even better. And that would allow us to set these algorithms to make it uh, to where the backup heat kicks in. And then 356, again, is not available because we don't have an outdoor temperature sensor. The reason for this is most utility companies like PSC in our area and uh, maybe other parts of the country, they require the backup heat to be locked out at 50 degrees because they know that the heat pump is going to produce enough heat under those middle of the road conditions and there is no reason to turn the expensive heat, the inefficient heat on to back up the heat pump. So they want to make sure that it does not come on below uh, 50 degrees. So again, the compressor lockout balance point shuts off the heat pump when it gets too cold outside for it to operate. And the outdoor lockout backup heat or just the backup heat lockout locks out the furnace so that it doesn't operate on anything above 50 degrees because the heat pump can do it a pretty good job. Maybe that was a bit confusing, so <laughs> feel free to uh, reach out with questions if you'd like me to clarify that. Uh, so 356, let's see, 365, compressor cycle rate. So these cycle rates, it, it basically tries to tell the thermos, the thermostat decides to not have the unit come on too many times every hour. So it stretches the on and off times based on the temperature inside. So it doesn't just set short cycle on and off. And that's to extend the life of the compressor because the starting torque of the compressor is just the worst part that can happen to a compressor. I mean, I've heard compressors that have ran for 30, 40, 50 years with no problems. Like basically they can last a long time. The starting is what kills compressors. So they just want to have a reasonable amount of starting and stopping cycles per hour. Three hours is pretty common, so I usually don't change any of those default settings because they apply in most situations. 375 talks about heating cycle, how many times per hour. Furnaces are not as picky, especially electric ones. They're almost like it doesn't matter. But if you have a gas furnace, this number would be maybe like five by default. Again, keep in mind, Gas furnaces take about 10 to 12 minutes to get up to their full operating temperature and stable operating conditions and efficiency. So having any more than five or six per hour is just short cycling. So you should have probably around three to five cycles per hour. 387, let's flip the page here, see what that one is. When you do this all the time, like almost every day, you'll have these things memorized. Um, but at first you may have to refer back to it quite a bit um, compressor protection. Uh, this one is set by default at five minutes and when you have a compressor running you obviously have the low side and you have the high side. So what you'd want to do is um, make sure that um, your compressor doesn't come back on to start a new cycle when it just finished another or if the power goes out even for a few seconds, that compressor stops running, you have a high side, a low side, and that compressor can't start. So it'll sit there and grind and overheat and maybe go out on an internal overload, um, or, or it can grind and cause some problems or whatever. So um, the reason you have a timeout here, or maybe while you're testing the equipment, uh, they don't want you to like turn it to heating, to cooling, and just kind of destroy the compressor. So it has a built-in timer. I have found, having done this for over a decade now, that most compressors will have a, like the pressure will equalize almost flat after about two minutes. So I like to turn this to a two minute timer 
because a lot of times I'm here servicing the equipment and there's nothing for me to do in those, those five minutes. So if it only takes two minutes and I've watched dozens if not hundreds of systems and they're usually very close to even after about two minutes and it's safe for the compressor to come on. Anything less than two minutes, I don't advise. Um, so I'm going to change this to two minutes to make it easier for future technicians um, or myself when we come here to service this. And anytime I'm servicing a piece of equipment, when I find this set to five minutes or so, I always change it to two because I have never found a system, at least in the residential arena, that takes longer than that to come almost close to equal. If you have a different opinion, let me know. Um, I'm not saying I'm right, but that's what I've observed. Okay, next menu item is 425, that's Adaptive Intelligent Recovery. This is a really important menu item because what can happen with a lot of your homeowners, uh, I, I would say the majority of people, if they wake up at 6 and they want the house to be 70 degrees at 6 o'clock, they are going to want the furnace to start early enough so it's at 70 degrees by that time. And the thermostat looks back seven to 10 days to see how long it took it previous days to get up to that temperature. And it will self-learn every single day, looking back at the last week or so, to see what's the weather like and how long does it take it to get there. So each day it adjusts its start time, maybe you know half an hour early, 25 minutes early, 45 minutes early. It self-adjusts constantly so that it gets close to perfect every single day. The problem is when homeowners have night shifts or they are light slippers or whatever, when they set their program, it may not be based on comfort, it may be based on sound, draft, or things like that. So if you turn on, actually I think most of these thermostats come with this setting turned on, but if you don't ask your client whether sound is important or anything like that, uh, they may be very disappointed when they set the, th the thermostat to come on at six o'clock to be at 70 degrees, and it starts running at five o'clock and they get woken up prematurely. So it can be a, a big disturbance for them. So as much as this is a useful feature, it could actually be the opposite for certain people. So you just have to know your client and what's important to them. And those clients, if they're really sensitive to the temperature, they might be more than happy to, to wait, you know, from six to 6.45 for the house to get from 65 to 70, rather than them being woken up a little bit earlier. So those are the two watch outs I can tell you there. Um, and let's move on here. 430 minimum cool set point. So this is not a super important feature in most situations, but if you don't want the thermostat to be set any lower than let's just say 70 degrees, which is the recommended setting for air conditioning uh, or higher, uh, then you can change that here. At the same time, the high heat set point uh, this is the maximum you can set it for obviously you can reduce that if you don't want your heat to be set any higher i never found that to be important enough unless it's like a rental situation or a um, commercial space or something where people are messing with the thermostat all the time there you know somebody walks in turns the cooling way down somebody walks in turns the heat up and there's all this chaos and the system can never catch up so in those situations maybe the building owner might choose to either lock the thermostat, which you can do it from the menu, um, or they may choose to just like limit where they can set it and the system can't kill itself trying to please everyone. So those are some of the reasons why that exists. In most cases, I don't touch it because it's not necessary. Um, but then what's important for me as a service technician, if I come here to test the operation and I have a limitation on how, I, how high I can set it or how low, low I can set it, I'm not able to test the operation. I can go into a test menu, which is the next page over here, but I like to test the operation of a system the exact same way a homeowner would use it because then I'm proving the operation of the menu, of the thermostat, the wiring behind it, the equipment, how it responds, how it turns off, how it shuts off. So just for my peace of mind to feel like I am 100% um, complete with my work and I'm leaving a system behind that's working properly, I like to test it exactly the way the homeowner would use it. So I don't like to limit my high and low set points for that reason. Um, so let's move on. 435 talks about keypad lockout. That's what I just talked about. You can have a partial lockout, which doesn't allow you to change 
mode of operation from heat to cool, things like that, but you can just change the temperature and maybe it locks out things like prog the programming, you can't change that or, you know, it's a partial lockout. Um, I, rem I don't remember all of the features that it actually locks out. Full lockout is you have to come back into this menu to unlock it. So like you, you can't change anything. And you know, sometimes there's like um, nursing homes or certain places where the residents shouldn't really be messing with this thermostat. Um, so sometimes we get asked to lock out the screen and we just find the settings that work for them year round and it just gets locked out forever. So um, there, there may be reasons for that, but that's, that's how you do that. Um, Number 500 is indoor temperature sensor wired to your system, yes or no. So obviously you can do an indoor sensor. If you don't want to sense the temperature at the thermostat, you can do it somewhere else. 702, number of air filters. So here you'd want to say one because there is one. 711, air filter replacement reminder. This is really important to use this feature because most homeowners don't just think about these things. As long as they have heat or cool, they just don't think about it. Um, so in this case, it's a five inch media filter. So the least frequency should be about five, uh, let's see, um, one full season. If you have a heat pump and an AC, you probably want to do it every six months, which is the case here. So I'm going to turn it to six months and then you can do runtime days, runtime days, or you can do calendar days. Obviously runtime is more accurate based on how much airflow goes through the system, but I'm going to do calendar months just because it's the most sure way not to like overwhelm people with like hey last time i did it in april this time it's in july like you know it just causes a bit of conversation and confusion so uh, if you're able to explain the difference here for your homeowner then it's probably useful to go with the runtime days because it's more accurate but if you do it every six months um for a five inch filter is is a good interval so uh six months is uh setting number 16 so here i'll just use the plus button to go all the way to 16 and you don't want to install a thermostat like this and not do this. Um, 1410, what's that? Um, clock format, obviously you can use military time or 12 hours. Um, and some clients actually care about that. Uh, we have a lot of clients that are in the military or different types of services, so they, they request that. Um, 415 daylight savings time, depending on where you install this. I know Arizona doesn't have it. So obviously you'd want to adjust that accordingly. Uh, 1420 is a temperature offset. And this is a useful thing to remember. Sometimes the thermostat is in a location that's affected by, let's just say the TV that's next to it or a screen or it's close to the kitchen. And at certain times, you know, it gets a blast of heat or cold air or it's close to the front door. All of these should be centrally located in the house close to the return where all of the air mixes, it's sort of even. But if that's not the case, or clients may have a thermometer or a weather station on their shelf and they say, hey, your thermostat is always at 70 and my thing on the wall is always 72, it's always two degrees apart. Then you can ask them, look, would you like them to, to be in sync and say the same thing? Because then you can go here and offset it by two degrees and it's going to be in sync with everything else in the house. And also keep in mind, different sensors are made differently. so. None of these sensors are like scientifically proven to be 100% perfect. So if there's a tenth of a degree up and down, or maybe a few tenths of a degree up and down, um, you know, you, you can actually mess with that a little bit to make it pleasing to the homeowners that really want to see everything equal across the board throughout their house. So that's pretty much it. And then next I'm going to hit select to advance to the next menu. It's going to say done. It's saving and now we're good to go. So if you're ever in this situation, Basically, what I would recommend is add the outdoor sensors so that we can lock out the heat pump so it doesn't operate below 30 degrees or below 35 and lock out the furnace so it doesn't come on at, on anything less than 50. It should only come on, I'm sorry, it should not come on above 50. It can come on below 50 to help the heat pump based on time, how long it's been on. Um, and maybe I can go to those settings just to kind of talk through them real fast. And it's talking about um, the backup heat droop right here, which is on time. And then um, upstage timer for backup heat. So this one means, that, hey, if the heat pump runs for, let's just say 30 minutes and it hasn't caught up, let's turn the backup heat on. So for clients who don't want to fall behind with their temperature, that's what you would do there. And we talked about the balance point already. So those are the reasons why the outdoor sensor is important. If you have any other questions about this, I know I've kind of went real fast through this. So I don't know if you want to leave, you know, listen to it at 
you know x you know 1.5 or 0.5 or 0.75 but um, hopefully it's useful in helping you um, and you can reach out with any other questions or comments call text whatever you want to do so i can help you further if i haven't addressed something you are facing right now thank you for watching